Uh, thank you for coming to this talk. Uh, really excited to give it to you, and it's a real pleasure to talk about something that I am genuinely passionate about, and it's always been a theme throughout my career that I've generally been involved in web performance. Just a few disclaimers. This is a technical talk, so I hope if you're a developer or a technical SEO person, I hope it's useful for you. And you know, even if you're a product person or a you know, outside of a t more technical sphere, maybe you learn a few tips and tricks about DevTools, so that could be useful as well. Just very quickly, I don't want to spend too long talking about myself, but a few um, a few links if you're interested to follow. Uh, that's UM2AsR. Even my name is spelled with one A because someone always gets my the username that I actually wanted. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll only uh, plug my employer just now. And uh, it's you know we do website performance monitoring at Debug Bear, but I don't want to push any sort of paid product onto you. So at the very least, you can just do, run a free web page test and. Uh, you know, have a look at the, the data that's available to you there. Cool, so the goals of this talk, like why are we talking about this? It's to expose you to some uh, practical and modern workflows in DevTools because I know it's a, it's a particular tool that you know, developers, technical SEO people want to get more familiar with, but it can be very technical, it can be very overwhelming. So um, like the goal here is to expose to you some workflows that maybe you're not using currently that would be helpful. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. Uh, this is the debugging workflow that I typically follow. Um, and we're not going to talk about point one, which is why it's slightly grayed out. The gathering of intelligence where you maybe you listen to what people are saying on social media or you, you take in feedback from stakeholders. That's, that's outside the scope of this. We're really going to focus on points two and a little bit about point three, which is how do you actually profile and analyze pages um, using Chrome DevTools? Okay, and we'll talk a little bit a little bit about fixing strategies. So not so much like here, add this code in and your performance is fixed, but more how do you how do you navigate DevTools to actually prototype and implement um, performance related features? Cool. So let's get into it. Um, all about analyzing pages. And before we get started, just my plea to you, or uh, yeah, like this is an appeal to you. Whenever you profile, whenever you test pages, make sure you throttle your CPU and network because it's. It feels almost futile nowadays. You know, we all have very fast um, developer machines, like very expensive machines, so it's, it's just not a good reflection. So make sure you, you throttle your CPU network. Um, in fact, you can even go a step further, and apologies in advance, I tested this. The video is a bit, I know it's the projector, but um, yeah, th this is me using a feature called remote debugging from DevTools, where I've plugged in my Android device over USB-C, and then you get, like a preview of the device within DevTools, and uh, you get to sort of replay interactions onto the mobile device, if that makes sense. So I never actually have to touch or fiddle around with the device, which is a really nice workflow. And the best part is, because I'm running this in performance mode, you get a performance profile at the end of it. Um, we're not going to, like the point of this talk isn't so much like click here, click that, do this, do that. It's just to expose you to the, the terminologies, and then you can, um, you can go and research it yourself. But if you are curious to set this up, the features that you want are called screencasting and remote debugging. I did this on Android, but it is possible to do on an iPhone. Um, back in the days, I would have said, you know, I'm sorry to inform you if you're using an iPhone device, there's not much for you. But actually, um, Safari Web Inspector is very like capable and very feature rich. So this is remote debugging. This is debugging an iPhone device, which is yeah very cool. And the whole point of that is again use real use actual devices. Don't just use your fast developer machines. Okay, I know what you're saying. You're saying Umar, we get it. We're going to throttle our CPUs. We're going to throttle our networks. We're going to real use real devices. Now what? Well, you've just been told your website is slow. One of the first places I would start is just running a Lighthouse report. You can run a navigation style Lighthouse report directly from DevTools. And yeah, not much to say about that. You get some nice metrics out of that, which tend to be, not tend to be, they are correlated to the page load process. However, there is more to that. And I'll talk about that in a second. When you run that Lighthouse report, apologies if it's a bit pixelated, I hope you can see it at the back. When you run that Lighthouse report, you get a bunch of recommendations. And truth be told, you know, in spite of the millions of tools and services out there, I would just focus on this. This is like the number one thing I would go to, and I would tackle each one of these recommendations. However, as I'm sure that some of you have experienced, this is not enough. Like sometimes you open it up and it's like, yeah, minimize your main thread, and you're like, where, how, like, teach me. 
Um, and there's sometimes a bit of a disconnect between Lighthouse and the actual, the rest of the DevTools. And that's the point of this talk, to kind of bridge that disconnect. In addition to a navigation report, um, I would also do a time span report. This is a little hidden feature in Lighthouse, which is really nice because we shouldn't just care about page load. We also need to care about the rest of the page lifecycle. Some of the best performing websites that I know have like atrocious, like after page load, it just gets atrocious. And it's because they have so much, um, dare I say it, so much JavaScript. So yeah, just be mindful, record a time span report, and then start doing common user interactions. And what you'll find is you start getting metrics that are pertinent to the, um, you know, the interactions that you're doing, which when you think about Core Web Vitals, interaction to next pane and cumulative layout shift, they are very relevant. I know of websites that have no CLS on page load, but then you go around clicking stuff and then like it's CLS all over, which sometimes is okay, it's to be expected, but sometimes it's not. And IMP, of course, where you, you're interacting and it tells you how long that interaction took. The next place I would go to after the Lighthouse panel is the Performance Monitor. Again, I can't do too much of like click here, click click that, so just do a search for these queries if you are interested in using this in your workflows. But once you've got the Performance Monitor open, oh, ironically in this video I do show how to open it up, so Command-Shift-P, search for Performance Monitor, and open that up, and it's this nice interactive visualization where you can do stuff on a page, and you get these like live metrics and it's, it's super cool um, and it's very high level it's no like it won't tell you what code is contributing to this but it just at a glance it, it gives you this kind of insight like oh the problems I have are primarily related to you know layouts and style recalculations aka browser rendering or maybe it's to do with the CPU usage maybe I've got too much JavaScript or maybe it's the heap size um, maybe it's a, a JavaScript memory issue so this kind of gives you a clue combined with the Lighthouse, like what area should you be um, focusing on for the remainder of your performance debugging workflows? This is the um, performance panel, and I think it's totally understandable and like full sympathies for anyone who has struggled with this, including like myself. Um, and I don't blame anyone that struggles with this because it looks a little like this, which is, is just wild to me how I feel like for the last 10 years, it hasn't really changed. Like until now, there are some new additions that we're gonna talk about. But um, just a quick run through, so we're all on a level playing field. When you make a recording, what you typically see, and again, apologies for any like pixelated, uh, if, if it's a bit hard to read. But um, yeah, you've got the activity overview, and generally, the more like spikes that you see here, generally the worse your performance is gonna be. Then you've got the film strip, which is this kind of a screenshot view, sorry, a screenshot view of um, the recording that you just made. Then you've got the network track, and I find that this track is like commonly forgotten about. Um, being able to correlate your main thread activity with what was happening in the network is a very powerful thing, so don't underestimate that. Then you've got the main track, arguably one of the most powerful uh, features and one of the most you know, relevant points in the performance panel. You need to look at what are the actual rendering events that were happening. And uh, yeah, this is the overwhelming part, and we'll talk about how to tackle that in a second. But yeah, this is called a flame chart, by the way, if you hear me use that term. And then you've got a summary pane, a summary view at the bottom. Cool, so about 10 years ago now, I saw this blog post from Paul Irish, and there was an image there of a Wikipedia engineer who printed out a DevTools flame chart on paper and then started sticking post-it notes and like writing little annotations. And I thought it was funny, and it made me like feel better that I'm not the only one that struggles with this. But what's funny is this isn't even the full image. That, that's the full image. Um, actually, no, it's not. This is the full image. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> So yeah, maybe that makes us feel a little better. It certainly does for me. But um, yeah, I want to expose some tips and some techniques to you so that you don't have to do this. Like, if you want to, by all means, but you shouldn't have to. You should know and have enough confidence with the performance panel that you know uh, how to interpret it. <clears throat> Before anything, I think you should do these three quick things. I promise it's gonna sound like menial, like why am I even talking about it? But it takes a minute, so like, make sure you do this. Make sure that screenshots are enabled, because if ever you're lost in the performance panel, the screenshots are your savior. You look through it and you understand, oh, like I see the button is being depressed. That means at that point in time, I was probably clicking on a button. Or, um, yeah, 
the, the screenshots will help you here, so make sure they're enabled. This is relatively new, the ability to hide tracks in the performance panel. So if you right click on the main thread, you can select configure tracks and yeah, you can just hide them all. Normally I would be a bit more conservative and I'd be like, no, you might miss something important. Hide everything, keep the main track. Once you understand the main thread, then you can be like, oh, is there something in the GPU that I need to pay attention to and you can expand, okay? And again, like, sorry for suggesting something so uh, little and, you know, it's kind of like, who cares, but it makes a difference. And when I observe people doing performance recordings, they don't always do this. Zoom in uh, through the activity overview and hit that little magnifying icon just so it, um, it expands the full width. So super small, should take you less than a minute to do all of those. Okay, cool, and that's just a recap. We've got screenshots, configuration of tracks, and zooming into the activity overview. Cool, and now some bonus tips which are a little more involved, and the point of these is to really get you confident in reading, interpreting, and understanding the performance panel. And yeah, a little disclaimer, and I really hope you don't feel shortchanged because I've like included these intentionally. Some of these are experimental. Now, in typical software development world, that means like, ah, it could just disappear tomorrow. I'm pretty confident that it won't. And some of these are in Chrome stable. Regardless, if you try or if you want to follow along with these things, um, go to the experiments panel in Chrome DevTools, search for performance and just enable, like all of these things will make sense to you by the end of this talk based on the, um, the, the title of the experiment. So yeah, uh, but to, to be honest, it probably will land in stable any day now. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about annotations. And this is, this. let's be clear, this isn't gonna fix your performance. This is to assist you in really grasping and understanding and interpreting a performance recording. You've got three types of annotations now in DevTools. This is new. And one simple annotation, which for the record, it might seem really subtle, but I've been using this and it's a game changer. Double click on a record and make a little note for yourself. This, let's be clear, this is only for yourself. This has nothing to do with like shipping to production or anything like that. These are notes for yourself, little reminders and little explanations. So that as you navigate through the performance panel, you understand, oh, this segment represents that and that's because of a network request. You can leave those comments um, and for the, for the record, you can also export a profile and then send it with your team. So that could be that could be useful as well. And then that's what it looks like when you zoom out. You kind of get those annotations that are sticky. And um, yeah, I think it's pretty helpful. Diagram annotations are interesting. Um, you right click on a record and you select link entries. So this allows you to link between records in the performance panel, which is a yeah, is interesting. Um, I did try to force myself to use it, couldn't really get the hang of it, but I thought I'd mention it just so you're aware. Um, when I did force myself to use it, I felt a bit like this, and it was a bit, yeah, overwhelming, so. Anyway, the last type of annotation is a time range annotation. So here I'm scrubbing through the screenshots in a performance panel, and I can see, ah, this part was the page load. So I'm gonna annotate that as a range, and I call that page load. Right, so a time range annotation is literally you hold shift, you form a selection, and you're able to annotate what that segment of the recording represents. This, I don't know how people receive this, maybe it feels like, ah, oh, why are we even talking about this, what's the point? To me, it made a very big difference and really helped with my like, confidence in just reading and being able to spend uh, like 15, 20 minutes trying to diagnose performance issues. This was a game changer for me. And when you open up the main track, the main threads, all those records end up being encompassed with each, within each time range, so it just makes, I don't know, it feels very intuitive to me. I really like it. Nice. Um, a little pro tip following on from the last thing. If you hold shift and you click a range, or sorry, a, a record, if you hold shift and click a record, DevTools automatically creates a time range annotation for you where the boundaries of that range are the start and end of that record. So it's a little convenience helper there. Let's talk about tidying up the call stack. This is maybe one of the most, yeah, the most intense parts of the performance panel is that flame chart, which is just it's so overwhelming, especially when you look at websites that use frameworks. 
This is just a heads up. This isn't a video, by the way. This is just a heads up with, that you can right click on a record and say add script to ignore list, which I do all the time. I'm surprised more people don't do this. So I'll do it for like React or whatever library or framework. Um, you've also got the ability to hide children if you see the, the second item in that context menu with the C, the C shortcut. And um, that lets you go from something that looks a little like this to something that looks a little like that, which is a lot cleaner in my opinion. And you're not really missing out on too much important information, assuming you don't care about the framework or library internals. I was in two minds whether to mention this. It's just, again, I've observed people doing performance recordings and I don't think people use the network track enough. So this is just a reminder, again, don't forget about the network track, use it. Um, you would be surprised, it's not just for the page load process, like even interaction to next paint issues when diagnosing those, sometimes you do see that interactions suffer because some like third party tracker came along and intercepted all your clicks and started like cherry picking from the DOM and making network requests. So being able to cross reference, oh, for this interaction, what were the network requests that were happening is very powerful. And uh, it's just a reminder that you should consider that. This is another relatively new thing. So here I'm looking at a performance profile recording and it's like super overwhelming. I don't wanna see all of this stuff. And I could do what we just saw where you right click and you hide or you ignore the script. But what if we just like, you know, minimize it entirely and just use our own track? And this is new. This is a new feature in DevTools where maybe it's aimed at framework authors. I don't actually know. Um, I personally am trying to use it, not, yeah, we'll see. But um, you can make your own track, you can make your own tooltips, you can put your own information in that summary pane and you can make it entirely customized to your use case. So if you want to include like the current state of your application and put bits of JSON in here or you want to show information about the logged in user, you can do that. And it's a pretty powerful debugging technique, a bit more involved because you obviously have to instrument your code. Um, it uses the user timing API. There is a, a link to the uh, demo if you wanna try this out. And the, um, the explainer or the documentation on how to use this and the code that you need is tinyurl.com slash devtools dash custom dash track. And there's a, that links to a Google doc that explains how to use this. Okay, so a little before and after. I say before as if like that's the bad thing. I actually think it's pretty cool to print out a flame chart. But, um, yeah, hopefully you, you don't have to do that. You don't have to stick post-it notes and reserve a massive like table in your office. But yeah, maybe you can get something looking a little like the bottom screenshot, which arguably is still, like when I see that, I'm still like, whoa. But compared to the alternative, I think this is a pretty significant improvement. Okay, let's recap what we just saw. We saw the, um, the free reminders where you should enable your screenshots, hide tracks you don't care about and just zoom in. Um, we saw the three different types of annotations, label, diagram, and time range. We saw the, the notion of like hiding frames and ignoring scripts, which just cleans things up a little bit. And we saw the concept of like custom tracks, which is kind of new and exciting. I want to talk a little bit about this new performance panel, which I've been seeing. And this is, a, yeah, I want to be careful with what I say. So it, yes, it's experimental but it isn't stable, so it really like it takes five seconds to enable and, and then you have it. So yeah, I hope you don't hear the word experiment when you're like, ah, I can't use it yet, you can. But it looks a little like this and it gives you Core Web Vitals information directly in the performance panel. It's very nice and like easy to use and it's all, it's all Core Web Vitals centric. You've got the local values, so lab data, in other words, uh, data from your own machine. You reload the page and you generate an LCP value and there it is in the local, the left hand value. The right hand is from Crux, the Chrome user experience report. And dare I say, like that's probably the value you need to pay attention to a little more. So if that's poor, but your lab data is good, then there's a disconnect there. Maybe you need to throttle your CPU and network like I was saying earlier. You've also got a few, like various configuration settings. You can, you know, quick access to throttle CPU and network. You can change the, um, you know, if you're pulling in like mobile or desktop data from Crux, you can sort of customize what that looks like, which is quite good. And then right at the top there, you might see where it says LCP element image. And closer to the middle, you see these interaction elements. That obviously, or not obviously, that correlates to the LCP element and the interaction to next pane element. So you get direct access to actually click those. 
So it's a handy little, it's just a convenience feature, that's all. And that's the new performance panel, what I call like landing page. So you go to the performance panel, this is what you now see. Once you enable the experiment, but more than likely this will be enabled by default in a probably short term future, I imagine. Along with that pretty interesting feature, you've also got this new performance sidebar, which is like so cool. I've been uh, you know, playing around a lot with this, very useful. And it gives you all these insights. And this reminds me like exactly of the Lighthouse panel, where you run a Lighthouse report and you get a bunch of like diagnostics or uh, general performance suggestions. This reminds me of that. Um, but there's a, a catch, but like a positive catch, or should I say spin. The recommendations that you get here they are integrated into the dev tools. So when you open up one of those recommendations, it will like overlay the relevant you know, annotations or metrics or whatever it is into the performance panel. So the integration feels a lot tighter and that feels very nice. Here I've opened up LCP by phase. And if that is a bunch of like uh, mumbo jumbo when you hear that, long story short, you have largest contentful paint, the core web vitals metric. And as part of that, it has different like phases or parts to it. Those parts are now annotated at the bottom of the um, what you can see there in the performance panel. So what it means is for the uh, element render delay, which is in the, the bottom right, for that phase, you know, in the past you might have heard like, okay, the browser had the image, but it couldn't paint the image to the screen, why? Now you can see exactly why by zooming into that performance panel recording, and you can understand, oh, there was like a render blocking or parser blocking script. And that was, even the browser had the image, it was preventing it from being painted. This now tells a complete story. And I think that, like, yeah, this is great. It, it's really good. Here's another section that I've opened up. So again, that's the performance panel sidebar. This is the, the performance panel as we currently know it. And you can see those red diagonal lines. Like These are new annotations that DevTools has added in for us. And it's... Um, in this particular case, the red diagonal lines indicate to us that there is a missed opportunity. So the LCP image came in a bit late in the process, and it's kind of hinting to you that, hey, you could have downloaded that earlier. So it's, um, yeah, don't get me wrong, this isn't fixing your problems, it's simply informing you and helping that analysis process. You've got a bunch of information about third-party script usage, kind of interesting. So this is just high-level stuff you can you can identify that, okay, Google Tag Manager contributes X amount of activity to the page. This is one that I'm really excited about because I've always found layout shift debugging to be a bit lacking. Like, I recall a time where like, you looked at layout shifts and it just, I don't know, it gave you coordinates or something that was just really hard to decipher. But now we have this new layout shift insights pane or panel. Um, so click a layout shift record in the performance panel and now you get these sort of more contextual information. Um, you've got a culprit at the bottom there, and that culprit can be things like a web font. So here I am on a Curry's, like this Curry's a retailer, and um, it's indicating to me that there is a web font, a custom web font that's come in, and that has contributed to a layout shift. And so this, this highlights to me as a developer, like, oh, so I know exactly what's going on. There's clearly a fallback font, and the web font comes in, it changes the, the dimensions or the font metrics, and things are shifting around. So that's a really nice, um, it, this helps me interpret the thing that I'm seeing. Cool, and let's just recap what we saw. So we saw a new performance panel kind of landing page, as I've been calling it, which is basically a bunch of core web vitals information. We saw the performance insight sidebar, which appears when you make a performance panel recording. And if you don't see it, click in the top left to open that sidebar. Okay, and then you got better layout shift debugging, which was pretty cool. That's what we just saw. Cool. Uh, let's talk about strategies for fixing. And what I mean by strategies for fixing is we don't really have time to go into like the vast array of actual web performance fixes, which is just never ending and always evolving. That's not really what this talk is about. This is more about how can you use DevTools to like prototype or try out enhancements or improvements or fixes to your website in the spirit of web performance. And we'll cover three strategies. We will talk about uh, blocking third-party resources, removing unused code, and pre-rendering pages, which probably doesn't make sense because this is out of context, but I will explain as we go on. Strategy number one is to block third-party resources for the purpose of being able to report back to your team, your stakeholders, your CTO, your whatever, your colleagues, 
yourself um, and being able to say like, is this really worth it? You know, the whole point is to quantify the damage that you are doing by including these first party scripts and understanding like, oh, you know, the, the thing from Google Ads or the thing from uh, TikTok that is slowing our LCP down by X amount of milliseconds. So being able to quantify that is a very powerful thing. And let's be real, um, third party resources and tracking tracker scripts are still an issue in 2024. So we need to find creative ways of solving that. <clears throat> Start here, go to the performance panel, right at the bottom, you've got the bottom up pane. And this is where I would start. If you group by third parties, which you can see I've applied that filtering, you can get a very high level overview for basically what was the damage that these various third parties contributed. Okay, so here I can see like, oh, Google Tag Manager, almost a second. I can now take that information, maybe I turn it into a report, maybe I use it as justification for why I should I know there's a cliche about developers loving to rewrite everything, but yeah, maybe there are times where it's justified. I wouldn't necessarily do it as to the extent that I have here, but be aware that in DevTools you can block requests and you'll, I'll get to the point in a second. If you open up DevTools, go to more tools, network request blocking, or just search for it from the command palette, you can start blocking requests. And what I would do is I would block all the resources that are pertinent to a particular entity. For example, you know, Typekit, which I think deal with fonts, or CookieLaw.org. And I'll do this one by one. And the whole point of this is to follow the workflow, which is, it's a, it looks simple, but it's, I think it's quite a powerful workflow. Make your performance recording, and that's your baseline. Then start blocking resources from a given entity. And then make a new performance recording. And the reason that this works is because the performance panel lets you compare recordings. As you record one, it, it remains as long as you don't clear it. And then you record another one and you compare the two. And this allows you to really quantify like, right, so when I got rid of that script, we saved, you know, we sorry, we shaved 200 milliseconds off the main thread and LCP improved in this way and CLS just eliminated entirely. And that's the spirit of what I'm trying to propose that you do here. Um, so again, it's not so much of a fix, it's more of a, a strategy that you can use. Okay. And in the real world, you'll probably take that information and you'll make a judgment call. Do I need to rewrite this? Do we need to remove it entirely? Do we need to reconsider uh, maybe like an alternative or a competitor? Let's move on. Uh, we'll talk about code coverage. And the gist of this, like this is an old feature, so maybe you've heard about this already. But in DevTools, it, apologies for the pixelation, but in DevTools, you can open up the coverage panel and that will show you the percentage of used code to unused code for a given recording. Very powerful stuff, but what I wanted to tell you is that this has like not just been sitting there stagnating. This is pretty cool. It now works with source maps, meaning that if I, you know, I profiled um, github.com here, so it's given me code coverage analysis for what code was used during the page load process of github.com, and if I was a GitHub uh, web developer, I would look at that and I'd say, oh, like autosubmit.ts, like TypeScript file, is uh, whatever, 50% unused, let me dig into that. And you can actually dive in in the sources panel and it will show you in red, can you see those line gutters where the red um, vertical lines are? It will show you this bit of code was unused. So maybe I say to that, you know what, that's not too, too big, I'm gonna dismiss that, or maybe it is big and I have to like explore some, um, some different behaviors for loading strategies, maybe I should defer it to after page load. So I think that's really powerful and the fact that it links back to your original source code like, super cool. It also live updates. And what that means is from the coverage panel, which is what I've got open here, as long as that recording icon is on, um, you can interact with your page. Because a lot of you might be saying, well, so what if autosubmit.ts was unused? Like, you just landed on GitHub. Give it a bit, give it a chance. Click on some stuff. And that's what you can do. You can actually interact with the page and say, all right, for the top five most popular user interactions, it turns out that we still have 100 kilobytes of unused code. So maybe that's the code that you then take out and defer or whatever, load on in interaction, which by the way is a bit of a sketchy thing to do. I'm not so sure I believe in that, but yeah. Um, at the very least, it's a good analysis technique and it gives you room for exploring how to defer that. Cool. Um, in terms of how you validate those improvements that we were just discussing or fixes, if you can call it that, um, you would validate that using a few techniques. One technique is to 
um, you know, the core web vitals information that we just saw in the performance panel landing page. You know, use that. Make sure that things are actually getting lower and lower, or rather that figures are improving. Um, sounds silly to say, but compare the film strip recording. So if you've just gone ahead and like blocked a bunch of resources, does the visual appearance of the page load process actually look better? If it doesn't, you're doing maybe something wrong, or maybe you've uh, discovered like a weird quirk in your website. I have done that technique that I spoke about earlier where I blocked third party resources and performance got worse. And it was because you know your website can take entirely different code paths uh, depending on whether a resource is or isn't available. And then finally, for the real like nitty gritty low level statistics, go to the performance panel summary pane, which is you know it's at the bottom. We, we saw it earlier a little bit, and uh, that should tell you exactly you know. So assuming you've completely stripped away a resource, you've blocked it in the network panel. Oh, sorry, in the request blocking panel. How does rendering change? How does scripting change? Is it actually improving? Um, is functionality broken? But improvements are to be made. So you can start answering those questions and really use that as ammo and justification to the wider team to be like, should we use this? Should we defer that unused code and so on? Cool. Um, I was hoping to show a quick live demo. It's, yeah, it's a bit involved, it's a bit technical, but I, I hope at the very least it's useful. Um, and I'm going to hold the microphone and do this with one hand, so I'm not sure how that's going to work, but we'll see. Okay. Sorry, I just have to turn off mirroring. Hmm. Yeah, apologies for the... I wasn't expecting the pixelation and the resolution issue, so sorry about that. Um, all you really have to pay attention to is DevTools. The web page is on the left, and the fact that it's so zoomed out is intentional. I don't want you to pay attention to that. I am going to be like clicking random hyperlinks in in the uh, in the web page, but you don't need to pay attention to the contents of the web page. We're really focused on DevTools, and the whole point of this part of the talk, this sort of uh, the crescendo of this talk, if you like, is to be like, here's how you use DevTools to actually prototype or implement a performance feature that you can then like, uh, you know, give a thumbs up or thumbs down, like, yes, we should do this. And the gist of it is, we've got this random bakery website, which I have no affiliation to, and I'm navigating through it, and you can feel that sort of stutteriness, and for the record, this isn't bad. I chose this because it's so simple, and like, it's just a nice, simple website. So this is not bad. This is not to say anything, anything negative about this website. But yeah, I'm gonna, in addition, oh, oh no, oh, there we go. Uh, I'm going to throttle the network. Remember I said to do that earlier? So I'll, I'll be generous. I'll leave it at fast 4G. Can you see that at the back where it says fast 4G? Yeah? Oh, thank you. Uh, OK, cool. So I'll navigate through, and you can feel that sort of stutteriness. You can feel how I think it's this link where you'll see the images. They take maybe a second or two or three to appear. Um, how can we tackle that? How can we improve the performance of subsequent navigations? Well, one technique is to use something called pre-rendering. And this talk and this part of the demo is not about pre-rendering. So don't, let's not focus Ooh, that text. I hope you can read that text. Um, the part of this demo is not to focus on this feature called speculation rules. All you need to know is that um, speculation rules is this web, modern web API feature with questionable um, browser support right now, but decent in Chrome, I believe. Anyway, all I'm doing is I'm inserting a bit of JSON to the page that says, hey, uh, Chrome, for all hyperlinks that you find on this page, href matches, see that, wildcard, for all hyperlinks that you find, I want you to pre-render, okay? And I'm gonna go to the appli application panel, and scroll down to, I think it's speculative loads, okay. So this is meant to be cool feature number one, cool DevTools feature number one, I should specify. There we go. Nice, in fact, let me do it on a, when you see some have failed, it's because Chrome has a limit of how many pages you can pre-render. Let me do it on this page. There we go. All right, seven successes correlate to those seven hyperlinks in that menu. Um, and don't again, don't worry about reading. I do apologize that so I'm zoomed in. It's because, sorry, it's so zoomed out. It's because if I zoom in, we lose the, the menu. Maybe I'll leave it like that. Okay, cool. Um, so now th this is kind of what I want to, highlight to you. First of all, DevTools has a um, this pre-rendering panel or speculative loads panel, and it will tell you what pages were like pre-rendered. So there were seven. I think you can also, yeah, you can see the URLs that were pre-rendered. That's pretty cool. You can click on one. 
and it's probably hidden, but yeah, you can even inspect, you can get a new, a brand new DevTools to inspect the pre-rendered page because it's basically sitting there in the background. Also, and let's do this together, I'll do three, two, one, go. And when I say go, I'll click on the link. We'll see if it loads fast or not. Three, two, one, go. Ah, that was nice and fast. Three, two, one, go. Hmm. So what happened there? Well, I inserted that JavaScript into the console panel. As you might know, when you insert it into the console panel, that is not a permanent change. Like that's, I've inserted it into one page, I've now moved away and I've lost it. So that pre-rendering instruction that I gave to Chrome, gone. Let's move on to cool DevTools feature number two to kind of tackle this. If I go to the sources panel, it turns out that there's a snippets pane. And snippets you can think of as bookmarklets, if you remember those things. Um, and we'll call this add spec, sorry, doing this with one hand, uh, add spec rules, and I'll paste in that JavaScript, close the console panel, save this snippet or bookmarklet, whatever you want to call it, back, back to the application panel, there we go. And now, command shift P, exclamation mark, and now you can run those bookmarklets very easily. So that's, again, it's a very small yet kind of interesting feature I thought I'd show. Um, and there we go, I've just executed that. Whoops. Yeah, just executed that from the command palette. Um, three, two, one, go. Ah, nice and instant. But again, we're back where we started. I, I don't wanna have to like run this snippet every single time I navigate to a page. So how can we get something a little bit more permanent? Well, what I'll do is I'll go, I'll go to like whatever, the opening times page, and I'm gonna head on over to the sources panel. And this is interesting DevTools feature number three. If I open up the overrides pane, turns out you can actually make permanent changes to web pages directly from within DevTools. And when I say permanent, of course, I don't mean in production. I'm referring to um, I'm referring to on your local environment. So I enable that. If you're doing this for the first time, it will ask you to pick a folder um, on your file system. I picked my desktop, and let, let's try this out. So I'm currently on the opening times page of this random bakery website. So Command P, search for opening times. I'll open that. Um, I can see it says, hello, lovely customers. So I'll do a search for customers. Sorry, doing this with one hand. Add some exclamation marks. Add some confetti. Hit S, reload the page. And what we expect to see is those, there we go. So the page has updated. And as I navigate away and come back to opening times, that will still be there. And that's pretty nice. So DevTools actually has made this, um, it's basically made, whoops, basically made a file tree for all the overrides that I want. Where is it? Overrides here. I'm gonna delete that because we don't need that anymore. You've seen the, the proof of concept. Why did I just do that? What was the point of, what, to add some confetti? No, it was to add the speculation rules or the pre-rendering behavior onto all the pages, maybe, but I don't really want to go to each HTML page, add that little block of JSON, and it feels too tedious, so. Cool DevTools feature, what one? Are we on number three or, yeah, number four, I don't remember, but <laughs> this is the next thing I wanna show you. If we go to the network panel, turns out that you can add speculation rules, or let's just call it pre-rendering to keep it simple. You can add that for a HTTP header. And if I right click on opening times, and I go to, uh, you can't see that, can you? One second. There we go, override headers. <laughs> uh, zoom back out. And uh, yeah, now you get the ability to override headers, which is very cool. Now, because I've done this, oh, sorry, because I've researched this before, I know it's called speculation. The header that you need to specify these rules is speculation rules. Um, I think that would be a file path. So rules.json, hit enter. Okay, so are we expecting some speculation rules? No, of course not, because we don't have that rules.json file that has not been added. Um, in fact, if I open up the console panel, it's actually telling me 404, not found for rules.json. So, cool, I've lost track of like what cool DevTools feature number we're on right now, but I say cool, I hope you find these cool, maybe you find it boring, I don't know. But back to the sources panel. So we don't have a rules.json, right? It doesn't exist. However, as I said before, DevTools makes basically a file tree for your override, so I can just right click, select new file. Um, what was it called? Rules.json, very good. Paste in that. That's not valid JSON. Um, even if we get rid of the JavaScript code that adds the script tag, still not valid JSON. So if I go to my console panel, 
up a little bit because I've got this in my history. There we go. We can call json.stringify, and then we get the, the valid JSON version of the pre-rendering logic. And then I can use copy dollar underscore, and that gets the result of that expression into my clipboard. OK, now paste that in. There's our valid JSON. Don't like that. It's minified, so I'm going to hit the oh, one second, that little icon at the bottom to pretty print. There we go. Nice and pretty printed there. Is this going to work? Let's give it a go. Reload the page. Hmm. Received a response but in received a response with an invalid mime type. Okay, so this is the last problem, and I promise this is the um, the last fix that we're going to do. Now, if I select this console message, yeah, I'm, I'm in two minds whether to show this. This isn't going to be a demonstration. This is effectively a name drop. DevTools now does AI insights for your errors. However, I'm not logged into Chrome, so it's not going to work. Also, the results are kind of sketchy, and I don't trust them. So <laughs> this will only get better over time. And I'm sure in the near short to medium future, this is going to be amazing. Right now, it didn't actually help solve my problem, even when I was logged in. Anyway, let's fix this very last uh, remaining issue. It's text HTML. It needs to be application JSON or whatever it is. However, this is for a file. This rules.json is a file that doesn't really exist in production. So how are we going to? That's going to be interesting. Um, network panel, find the rules.json, right click, override headers. Um, in fact, we don't need to add a new header. We need to change the content type header to application. Sorry, one hand, uh, spec you. Sorry, you have to watch me type this. Uh, speculation rules plus JSON. I know it's a bit of a funny syntax. Open up the console panel, filter that down to, because I don't, there's too much noise right now. Keep the application panel open. We're hoping that we see some green over here. Oh, of course, we get seven failures because it's a live demo. <laughs> One second. I wonder if it's because the menu is hidden. That can't be it, can it? One second. Let me zoom out, reload the page. Oh. I swear I did this like five times right before this talk, and it was working perfectly. I wonder if, did I make a typo in the speculation rules plus JSON? That's right, isn't it? Applic Does that look right? Yeah, OK. Can you trust me that this works like any other time? <laughs> Um, if you're not doing a live demo, I promise this works, and you'll be at a point where you can start navigating through and be like, this is blazing fast, and I did that entirely through DevTools. What is going on? Yeah, anyway. Um, Chrome can actually ban, not ban, can prohibit pre-rendering based on all sorts of criteria. Maybe it's because I'm tethered to a mobile network. It, it's all sorts of reasons. Um, in fact, you can even inspect... No, of course, speculative load failed. Of course, it's not going to be a helpful message, live demos. Um, but really, I did this like five times before the talk. It worked each time. Um, so yeah, sorry for that ending. But the, the point was we would start navigating through. You would see no more layout shifts because the page was pre-rendered. You would see images that were loaded instantly. And it was yeah really nice. But just imagine it for now. Uh, back to Keynote, almost done. Yeah, so you just saw page pre-rendering, or at least you imagined it. Um, you saw local overrides and header overrides, which is quite a new and exciting thing. You saw speculation rules debugging with this dedicated speculative loads panel in the application panel. And you saw snippets, which is, I don't know, maybe it's very small to you, but it's something quite handy to me. Um, and that is pretty much it. So I really appreciate your time. There are some links to check out. And yeah, thank you so much. Do you have any questions? And in case you, we have French ones, I can do the translator. Hi, thanks for the presentation. It was really insightful. Uh, but uh, pretty dense too. Uh, would you maybe have some cool online resources to dig in deeper into uh, profiling and dev tools in general? Yeah, so, yeah, can you hear me? Is that on? Yeah. 
Um, cool. So yeah, I guess you heard the question because you're using a microphone, so I won't repeat it. But yeah, in terms of other resources, so I've got my mailing list. So if you search for my name, um, Uma Hansa, I've got a mailing list, and I've got a bunch of like, I think I'm at 200 like tips at this point, like 200 newsletters that I've sent out. So I try and stay up to date with these things and relay it to the community. Also, my employer, Debug Bear, we've got a ton of free educational resources. Like we've got YouTube videos, articles, so you can go and digest that. But I do appreciate it, it was a bit dense, so sorry about that. It was, it was meant to be a scattergun approach. Throw everything out and for anything people find useful, they can digest that and then go and search for it later. But yeah, mailing list, the official DevTools documentation, of course, very like very comprehensive, very excellent. Um, and yeah, the, the Chrome Developers YouTube channel as well, they've got a lot of information on this stuff. So. Thank you. Thank you.